Welcome to the recovery.com podcast. I'm Dr. Mala, Editor-in-Chief at recovery.com, and today I'm joined by my fellow host, Amanda Uphoff, Chief of Staff at recovery.com. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Dr. Mala. Today, we're thrilled to introduce Cliff McDonald, our very own Chief Growth Officer at recovery.com. His diverse background spans Wall Street, to founding businesses in technology and consulting and so much more. I'm so excited to welcome you here today, Cliff, and to share your journey with our audience. Welcome. Thank you. Um, a warm welcome, Dr. Mala and Amanda. Great to see you. Great. Always great to see you, Cliff. Really excited for this conversation. So we'll jump right in. You have a recovery journey, and it's a powerful one. Can you tell us about it? Sure. So I'm comfortable saying that I'm a recovering alcoholic or a grateful recovering alcoholic even. Lots of the folks in the space these days prefer substance use disorder. And I think the reason why I'm comfortable saying I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic is because I've really used a 12-step program and I've spent a lot of time in the rooms and that's the terminology that I've heard. There's a thing in the rooms with the 12 steps, and it's laid out in chapter five, how it works. If you've decided you want what we have, and you're willing to go to any length to get it, then you're ready to take certain steps. And I've seen people that are really going through life, happy, joyous, and free. And I did decide at some point when my life got pretty tough that when I started to turn the corner, I saw these people that looked like, wow, I, I do want what they have. And as both of you know, in the old school 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous, that is how you introduce yourself. That's hard to do the first time. So yes, indeed, Dr. Mala, I am a grateful recovering alcoholic. Thank you for that that start. Yeah, I'm curious. I know you you have such a wide swath of experience and education Tell us a little bit about your journey from Wall Street to becoming an entrepreneur and how those experiences shaped everything that transpired and your journey. Yeah, it's interesting. I definitely have a non-traditional path. And if you look at the different stops, I think it'd be hard to make sense of it. Life isn't linear and it never unfolds the way we expect, sometimes nor the way we want. I think my path is a little bit more disjointed and seemingly random because I really wasn't true to myself. And I think I was doing things that I thought I was supposed to do mm -hmm. and really not listening to the inner voice or my heart, whatever that may be, uh, that was always there. And looking back, I, I really have lived a double life. I, I was a very good student and a gifted athlete. And if you looked at me growing up, through junior high and high school, you would say that is a wonderful student athlete. Uh, but at the same time, I had this other life where uh, I was getting severely intoxicated with my friends since I was 13 years old. And that was a secret. And that remained a secret for a long time until it didn't. So I experienced wholeheartedly the progressive nature of this disease. And a lot of people were really surprised when I really hit a bottom and my bottom was very public. But if I look back now, it's abundantly clear that I have used alcohol from the beginning and I used it very differently than what we say in, in our world in the normies. The people that don't struggle with addiction or who aren't alcoholic, they have a shutoff mechanism. And they say, wow, what I'm putting into my system is making me feel like I'm out of control and I should stop. From the very beginning, I was the complete opposite. And so, Dr. Mala, I think you look at Wall Street, that's because I graduated from college with a degree in psychology, which was kind of an accident in and of itself. If I had really followed my heart, I would have been a coach. Uh, I played college football and I loved the team dynamics, I love the locker room, I love the accountability, do your job, I had great coaches. But I had gone to that school partly because I thought it could give a pedigree mm. 
and a brand that we didn't have in our family. And then all of the other guys were going to do Wall Street jobs, investment banking, consulting. I thought that was what I was supposed to do. Mm. So I think it took me a long time to really figure out what I'm supposed to be doing. And I've learned the hard way you could argue, but meaningful purpose work is always what's good for me and being tied to a mission. And uh, I'm so grateful to be here with you, my teammates, and doing this work that we're doing together. I do think this is the path Mm -hmm. for me from a spiritual perspective. I think there's a plan. Uh, I think I had to get beat up pretty good for me to see what my plan is, but I wholeheartedly embrace that today. Thanks for sharing that, Cliff. I am curious to hear more about your early life, about your time at Dartmouth, about when it stopped being a secret that you maybe partied a little harder than others or that it was different for you. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure thing. So early life, I I would say my childhood was fantastic. Uh, I I, I really think I had a blessed childhood, uh, a lot of love, tremendous fellowship. Part of that's a choice too, right? What do you want to focus on? I I think I did hit the cortical lottery a little bit. I'm an optimist. And, and I always have been, except for a couple of years when it got really dark and I was really sick. My dad is one of nine from South Boston, a working class Irish Catholic South Boston. Goodwill Hunting, the movie, is based on South Boston, Southie, the old Southie. My dad is a real old Southie guy. My grandpa was a World War II veteran, 82nd Airborne, three Purple Hearts and pretty scrappy living. My dad grew up in a three flat, uh, shared a room with four brothers. My grandfather was a wonderful guy, but I'm comfortable saying I believe my grandfather was an alcoholic. I believe my grandfather had PTSD. He had three Purple Hearts in World War II. He was a paratrooper. And looking back, I think it's pretty clear that he was PTSD. The McDonald family was a very lively clan, and we would get together all the time and celebrate holidays and birthdays, and it was festive, really festive, like a bottle of Jameson being passed around and lots of drinking, and that was just normal. And as as a little kid, you would get a sip of beer or something, and some of the kids were like, ooh, and I can remember even back when I was a real little kid, I was excited to get a sip of beer, and I liked it. And I liked it because I felt tingly and because it was kind of naughty. So that the culture, when the wheels came off for me, 2016, 2018, I had never seen a therapist before. And when I explained my history, the culture that I was born into, she was like, you're a ticking time bomb to be an alcoholic. Of course, you were born into it. And then I started really drinking in junior high school seventh grade, I believe, like 13 with my friends. And that's so young and brain development is like halfway done. And we would plan, right? Like, and we would be creative. We would drink in the woods Mm -hmm. and plan when we could go do it. So for me, the obsession of the mind kicked in early too. I can remember like wanting to drink and planning it out. Like, oh, if my parents are going out or if someone's parents are away, Who's going to buy it? How are we going to get it? And planning pretty effectively to do that. Junior high was hard for me. I had a few events that, looking back, I I think maybe trauma. One was in eighth grade. I played football for the first time. And uh, I, I had asked my parents if I could play football for a long time. My dad was a very, very gifted athlete. He was an All American college football player, New England heavyweight boxing champ. I saw football. And I was like, I want to play that game. But my dad didn't let me until eighth grade. In eighth grade, I was a late bloomer. I was 5'2", 126 pounds. And my first scrimmage I ever played in, I broke my femur, a complete break. An ambulance came. I was taken to the hospital. They set my femur in traction. And I was awake when they did that. And that was really painful. I was in the hospital for like seven weeks. Mm. And then there was a bullying incident in my junior high school where this kid who was the toughest kid in the school who was a year older than me targeted me and 
kind of humiliated me in front of a whole bunch of people. Yeah, it, it, it was hard for me. And I remember every time I could drink, I, I felt like my fear was gone. And I had some issues with my dad, too. Uh, my, my dad was a, a very intimidating presence. My dad was a wonderful, complex guy who was extremely loving. But I feared him. I, he used a leather strap, right, as punishment. And I feel odd talking about abuse. I don't know if that's abuse, if I was physically abused. But if I got in trouble in a leather strap, that was pretty hard. I remember my dad reminding me he was taking it easy on me. So drinking right away for me was this escape. All of that fear was temporarily gone. And it's a depressant. And it worked for me through junior high, high school. But at the same time, Dr. Mala Amanda, I was a good student. I had 3.7 grade point average, really good SAT scores. You know, I won scholar athlete awards. So I'll fast forward, you asked about Dartmouth. Coming out of high school, I was an all-state football player. I was a state runner-up wrestler, a captain of both sports. I had a few scholarships coming out of high school, went on a recruiting trip to West Point. I was getting recruited to play football there, which was very intriguing for my family Mm -hmm. with my grandpa's background. Mm -hmm. I remember the community was really excited about that. So I went on a few recruiting trips, had a scholarship at University of New Hampshire where my dad went, and then I went up to Dartmouth College, two hours north of Boston, in the middle of the woods in New Hampshire, and it was quiet. It was really quiet, and it was peaceful, and it looked like what I thought it was going to look like, this idyllic college setting. And then I met the coach, and football was really important to me. And right away, I felt like that this coach here with a young guy, his name is Buddy Tevens. He just passed away last year. An amazing, amazing guy. The pretty similar background as me, actually. He was only like 31, 32, but big Irish Catholic family in the Boston area. He had this magnetism. And I was like, I want to come here and I want to learn from him and I want to be his teammate. And I think the unhealthy part of this, and Mala, with your clinical background, you could probably... <laughs> do a lot with this. But I remember also thinking like, if I go here, I can help my dad. My dad grew up really poor. And he complained a lot about being poor. Mm -hmm. He had what's so clear now, uh, a scarcity mindset. I would get yelled at if I took a shower for more than 30 Mm -hmm. seconds. Mm -hmm. What do you think I'm wasting hot water, blah, blah, blah. Like I had to eat, ask to eat food in my own house. It was always yes, but can I have seconds? If the door is open during the winter time for more than a split second, you're yelled at just tremendous scarcity. And if you grow up with nine siblings and father who's a Boston cop, there's not much to go around. Uh, My dad also had issues with rich people. He had real issues with social class. So I had this vision. I loved my dad. If I go here, maybe like the name on the back of my jersey will mean something different. Maybe we'll be able to ascend and become part of this different class. Um, I realize now that's unhealthy. Uh, No one asked me to be a savior. But I do think it was coming from a good place. But I think that started also a little bit of a, a thing, like I have to become someone different than who I mm. am, if that makes sure. sense. So. That the pull of family and the culture that we're brought up in within our family, I mean, it, it has such a great impact. And I can see how your dad played a role in that. What about the rest of your family, your your mom, siblings, how did that all manifest and impact you or influence you as well? My parents were absolutely awesome, loving. Their story is a wonderful romantic story. So our immediate family was just my parents and my sister, who was 13 months older than me. My mom and my dad met at the University of New Hampshire. They were both first time college students from their families. My mom grew up just north of Boston and they kind of fell in love like 
really fast and they started dating. And then my mom got pregnant with my sister while they were undergrads. And they must have missed the family planning class because she got pregnant again <laughs> with me. So they had two kids, 13 months apart, and they graduated. My dad barely graduated. He had some challenges. So they were young and they didn't have much and they struggled, but they had a lot of love and they had a family. And I always remember feeling like tremendous love and it, and it was fun. We had a lot of fun together. My mom, looking back, it's interesting. I think it was a matriarchy. My dad, who passed away in 2004 at age 55, uh, I, again, I can't judge if anyone else is an alcoholic. That's a self-diagnosis. But I can say, I don't think my dad would have died at 55 if he lived differently. My dad was kind of a one-speed guy, and he went hard with everything that he did. I can remember early my dad saying, your mother saved me. I wouldn't have seen 30 years old if it wasn't for your mother. So my mom, I think, really kept some structure uh, with, with our house and kind of like managed my dad fairly well. My mom stayed home with my sister and I when we were young. She was a homemaker. So we had a lot of really, really good time together. It's pretty cool when I was about 10 years old, I think, uh, fifth or sixth grade. My mom had studied sociology. She went back and got teacher certified. She became a teacher. And then she ascended over time. She ended up becoming an assistant principal. And then she ended up becoming principal of the largest middle school in Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, my mom was extremely intelligent. She understood people really well. She was very honest and direct, a really, really gifted leader. Would have been interesting to see what my mom would have done in different arenas. Um, I think she could have been a great CFO, but she had a wonderful career for herself. So, yeah, so family was great and it, it was loving. And again, I've shared with Amanda, I kind of was a little bit of like the golden boy mm. because I didn't get in trouble. There were these isolated incidents that really started to happen mostly in college. I kept a lot of what I was doing unknown mm -hmm. to my parents. Mm -hmm. Our friends and I were doing things that our parents didn't know. And then I was off at Dartmouth and Dartmouth had a very big drinking culture. My drinking changed a lot at Dartmouth. My freshman fall there was really difficult. I was not prepared for Ivy League curriculum. I took the wrong classes. You know, I had a 3.7 grade point average in high school with very little effort. And I really struggled my freshman fall. I got a 1.8 grade point average. And I took the wrong classes. I was in over my head. And I didn't sit in the front row and raise my hand. I did the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. I retreated. And for the first time ever in my life, I questioned my intelligence. And I questioned if I belonged there. And that was hard because I shared with you this like vision I had, oh, I'll go here and here's how it's going to unfold. And it didn't go that way. And going from the big man on campus, right? Like Golden Boy, all this stuff, student athlete, to I don't know if I can make it here mm -hmm. was really hard. Sure. My identity changed a bit where I became kind of a little bit like a dumb jock. It, it, it's hard for me to say that because that is so not who I am, nor who I aspire to be. I, I love being with all different types of people, but I got really isolated. The place where I was comfortable was on the football field. I felt like this is an arena where I'm comfortable. I know how to do this. I don't know this world where all you people came from. And I also felt like I was a poor kid because so many of the other kids there, they were driving fancy cars and taking vacations to Europe and the Ivy League doesn't give athletic scholarships. I had turned down athletic scholarships to go there. We didn't pay a lot, we got a ton of financial aid, but I had to do this thing called work study. Freshman fall, which is kind of part of your financial aid package, you get a job. And I think there were like three kids on the football team that had to do work study. I was one of them. The job they gave me was in the dining hall. 
very public, wearing like an apron, like cleaning up like dish trays and stuff. And the name of that dining hall was called Full Fair. That's where you went and it was like buffet style, right? You have your punch card, you go there and you eat whatever you want to eat or whatever. One of the kids on our football team who grew up very differently than me, he grew up very privileged, white, private school. He thought he would give me a nickname of Full Fair. And I felt really like degraded and humiliated. He was trying to make fun of me because I worked at the dining hall. We had a physical altercation because of it, which is not who I am. Uh, I had grown up uh, around a fair amount of violence and I hated it. And I didn't understand that, but I, I felt really humiliated and insulted by that. So that was really hard for me, that, that whole experience. And looking back, I got through it. And I figured it out and ended up being a B student. And I was really proud of that because I had to work hard to be a B student. I don't blame anything except me and being born a certain way for my alcoholism. But there are things that contributed to it. And that experience was definitely one of them. Sure. And again, the fear is gone when I drank, right? Like I can escape. And it was celebrated a little bit too to be someone that could mm -hmm. party mm -hmm. a lot, that could drink a lot. Yeah, you said your drinking changed around that time. Can you tell us what that means? Was yeah. it greater quantities? Was it less fun? Tell yeah, us about greater, it. Yeah, greater quantities for sure. So keep in mind, right, like I'm a student athlete and you know training really hard. So in season was good, right? Because it's extremely structured. So, you know, wouldn't drink at all during the week in the fall when we're playing football, but Saturday nights after the games, we would drink and celebrate. Dartmouth socially, out in the middle of the woods, the, the real social scene there is fraternity. Mm. And the fraternities, it's not like the Midwest or like Southern schools where they're like elite, whatever. They're basically like social clubs. Like you can go into any fraternity and, and drink and there's kegs of beer. The movie Animal House was... The screenplay was written by a Dartmouth alumni. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, yeah, right. So an alcoholic will find these places. And even on my recruiting trip, there was a lot of drinking. That mm -hmm. was favorable to me, right? Like, oh, this is fun. But Amanda, tremendous alcohol abuse. Contests of who could chug the most beer, vomiting and, and staying out and drinking more playing games where the punishment is drinking, excessive drinking, chugging beers. One of the fraternities had this thing called a ladle, which is this big, like huge ladle that if you fill it up, it's like three beers. And if you drink it, you're celebrated, right? Like that's just what it was. It, it was drinking alcohol excessively to get drunk mm -hmm. over and over and over again. I don't think in my life, I've ever had less than three drinks. And, you know, it was always, I'm drinking for this effect. I actually remember being puzzled, like, who would order like a martini to like enjoy it? <laughs> Why would you drink if you weren't drinking for the effect? That's how much I thought like differently of alcohol and drinking. The point was to get drunk, right? No. <laughs> That's how it worked for me. Mm. There were consequences too. I, I, I have scars. I, I have a scar here. I have a scar here. I have a scar on my elbow. I have seven scars on my body that I can point to it, that are all from things that happened when drinking. So one of them was horrible. Freshman parents weekend in the spring, I got really drunk at this fraternity that I was actually a part of. My friends had to like carry me back to my room, escort me back to my room. They put me down on my bed and I fell backwards. When I hit my head, it, there was an outlet that like came off the wall, like a little yeah. rectangle box yeah. mm -hmm. that came off the wall because the electrical was an old building. The electrical was external, like this column that goes down. And I hit my head on that and then I just slipped down and passed out in my bed and the next morning my parents came up for parents weekend and they came in and I was still in bed sleeping passed out and 
my parents came and like shook me like, hey, we're here or whatever. And I sat up in my bed and my mom's face turned white. I looked, my pillow was covered in blood. Oh. And I have a scar here on the back of my head. So extremely irresponsible, blackout drinking, repetitively. But then I would go to class that next week, right? And do my stuff and, and keep it together enough. Never any problems with police or getting in trouble, somehow avoiding all of that stuff until later on that wasn't the case. Mm. So, I mean, even during that time, you were managing it. It was part of your life you were essentially being successful at that duality, right? When did it start to occur to you, despite the injuries, despite the consequences, that this is a problem? Or did it? It really didn't. I think a few things probably. I was around other people that drank kind of like that Mm -hmm. too. And... So I think it was normalized from that perspective. There was some fun associated with that too, right? And not every time there would be consequences and a lot of friendship and laughter and all of those things. I couldn't wait to drink like as a reward. And and looking back, like it required a lot of discipline. Mm -hmm. Like even on like a Monday or a Tuesday, it would be like, man, I can't wait till next weekend because I know I'll be able to drink. And this has only become clear to me in the past few years in recovery of how much the obsession Mm -hmm. was there Mm -hmm. early and different than other people. Like I can remember in high school in the state championships for wrestling. Mm -hmm. So I made the, the state championships and I remember thinking like that day, like I could have gone out and been a state champ. That's what I was wrestling for. And I remember thinking like, how am I going to get drunk tonight? And I can't wait till this is done so I can get drunk tonight. And and my brain works very differently than non-alcoholics, right? Like other people, even if they were going to go out and and drink a little bit, that's not how they thought. Later, the disease is progressive and you notice these small changes over time. So I can look at drinking changed a little bit at Dartmouth, right? My identity changed a little bit my 20s in my early 30s were good. I had professional jobs. I didn't drink during the week. I met my wife, wonderful. Would drink on the weekends, not like to excess often. But every year, maybe like two or three shit shows is what I would call them. Like a couple of times at a wedding, drank way too much and did a few things. But you know, you kind of regret it. And the next morning, you're like, oh God, what did I do? What happened? But some of my friends were doing these things too. In 2004, my dad died. So I moved to Madison in 2004 with my wife, who's from Wisconsin. And I had just kind of finished the corporate world. I I had worked in technology for the past seven years and I enjoyed it and it was fun. I learned a ton. I went back to school and got an MBA, but I realized I wasn't satisfied. I wasn't challenged and I wanted to do something different. No one in my family had ever really worked in business and no one had ever certainly been an entrepreneur. But when I was in business school, I started to think like, I think I need to do something that's more like startup oriented. And I did work in technology for a high growth company from like 97 to 2000 uh, during the boom, which was really fun. So I decided to leave the corporate world and I was going to start my own business and we moved up to Madison, Wisconsin. And ironically, the first business that I really started on my own was an Irish pub. (laughs) A good friend of mine that I grew up with in Boston had worked for Guinness, the Irish brewery. So we moved up to Madison and they didn't have that concept here the way that we thought we could. So wrote a business plan and and raised some money and designed and executed that really well and built a successful business. While we were building that out in 2004, my parents came out to visit. My dad, we were doing a lot of the physical work on the building that was gonna eventually be the pub. A lot of the demolition and the construction and it was Memorial Day weekend, 2004. My dad was really, really gifted with a lot of 
trade stuff. He was a master plumber. He was a great carpenter. He could do almost any type of work like that. So we had made a decision that we were going to do some work on Saturday. And then we would do a half day and then we would do stuff socially. And my oldest son was one, Charlie. So we had had some drinks Friday night. We drank together. That's what we did. And we had fun together. So Saturday we go and the plan was we were going to do a half day of work and then we were going to call it quits and then enjoy the rest of the day. So that morning we were doing the work and, and my dad asked me, he said, hey, when we finish up, <clears throat> at noon, can we go and grab a beer? And there were probably five or six of us working that day. And I he said, yeah, sure. That sounds good. And then like an hour and a half later, he asked again. He said, hey, when we wrap up, we're going to go grab a beer. And I said, sure thing. And I was like, why is he asking again? So we finished at noon. And then we it was right down in the Capitol Square here. We went to the Great Dane, which was one of the only places down there then. And we get there. And we go up to the bar and we order And most everyone orders a beer and my dad ordered a beer and a double Jameson. I hadn't seen my dad a lot because I wasn't living at home. I had lived in Chicago and I hadn't been in the Boston area for probably six or seven years. And he asked me if I, he's like, you want one? And I said, no, I'm good. So no big deal. The beers come to my dad and i noticed he drank the double jameson really fast and then we finished our round 20 25 minutes the bartender comes back he said you guys want another round and yeah sure and then he asked my dad do you want another whiskey and my dad said yes and the bartender said a double and my dad said yes and i was like whoa what's up and he got unsettled because I said that, and he said, oh, you're gonna give me shit too? And, he, and I was like, no, it's, a, it's, it's all right. Implying my mother for his drinking. So then we finished that weekend, my parents went home, we had a really nice visit together. And then six weeks later, I got a call out of the blue and learned that my dad died. And he was my age now, I'm 53, my dad was 55. And that was the last time I saw him in person. We were drinking together and he was drinking alcoholically. And looking back, my dad was bloated. He didn't look good. He didn't sound good. Mm. He was angry. He like something wasn't good. I don't think he and my mom were doing that well at that time. He was 55. My, his grandson was one. And he was gone like that. The crazy part about this, though, I used that to drink differently. Mm. So, which is insane. Mm -hmm. Because now I look back, my opinion is my dad died of alcohol-related something, right? I think his heart exploded. We didn't get an autopsy, but probably a heart attack. My dad was six foot two, healthy looking guy. He was phys ed health teacher in Boston public schools for 32 years and he was gone like that. And I remember in some non-healthy way, I rationalized drinking differently after that. And I even remember saying like, I can mourn him and I can be sad. And I didn't drink a lot of whiskey, right? My dad drank a lot of Irish whiskey, Jameson. He drank some scotch. And I started drinking whiskey then too. Mm. And my drinking changed a little bit then in 2004. So there's these, the progression, right? And, and then soon after start drinking during the week, it didn't really progress until this is already very odd drinking for a normal person, but then it even progressed to a different level about 12 years later. So you talked about the alcohol was your ability to escape the fear that you were feeling. And now you're talking about that shift that happened and the rationalization. What did that sound like? What was the narrative in your mind for that rationalization? I think the first time I knew what I was doing was wrong. I had never drank like by myself until then. I had never like a whiskey at home to like take the edge off before this. 
And that's when it gets a little bit scary is when you know, like your behaviors aren't what like you should be doing, but you still do them. And then eventually it ends up hiding, lying, et cetera. And I think that's the beginning of in the 12 steps, right? We say step one admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our life had become unmanageable. When I'm doing things I know I shouldn't be doing and I continue to do them, I think that's the beginning of the unmanageability. I was a pretty good, good person from like a moral, ethical perspective. I was fair. I was kind. I was honest. And then when you know you're kind of not being honest with yourself, it really makes me sad. I'm getting emotional thinking about it because I say it got really bad for a couple of years, but it was longer than that. Sure. And I wish I hadn't lied to myself, but that's what it does. The, the, the disease is such a thief and it takes away so much from you, uh, it takes away your dignity. So that was a big pivotal turning point. How did you move forward and then balance family life and work and all of it. So you'd started kind of like that shift happened. Yeah. And then you you yeah, kept going. Yeah, it happened. And then we had two more kids. So that was 2004. And then 2004, like the next 10 years was pretty good. Three kids, you're busy. I kept it together for sure. And, and, and I was a business owner. And when things, I think the next progression was 2014, 2016, and 2013, I was running. So I was running the business that I owned. So we expanded and had two more. So we had three Irish publications. I was involved in the community. I was coaching football, involved with my children. And then I decided that I wasn't going to be actively involved in running that business anymore. So I left and my business partner was running that business. And I had an opportunity to go work for a company here in town as the chief operating officer of a, a local technology company. It was interesting, again, that was not something I'm passionate about. I'm not passionate about that type of business. What I was intrigued with was an executive title and a pretty good salary. And I kind of felt like I had been an entrepreneur and I had built this business, which enabled me to be flexible with time. Our family was growing. My wife stayed home for seven, eight years. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to kind of like rebuild my career and start to do some other things. So I took that position as a chief operating officer, essentially running this business for, for this guy who started this business. And it was a decent sized business, 40, 50 employees. And I did pretty well there. We grew that company pretty well, but my drinking changed then too to a different level. And another kind of thing that happened where I knew it wasn't right, but I kept doing it. I got into this routine where I would go work out at lunch and I would go into work early, have a good productive morning. I would go work out. So I'm still working out a lot. Being physical is really important to me. And I would finish my workout and then I would swing by the pub that I owned to kind of like check in. So I would check in, see how the day was going, whatever, and have a beer and drink a beer fast, whatever, and then go back to work for the afternoon. That over the next two years turned into a beer and a shot after I worked out. So then it was beer at lunch, then a beer and a shot, and then stopping there on the way home as well. So these little changes, right, over time, and then the next phase, which ended up being this real, real chaos for about 18 months, two years, when I became severely alcoholic, a big incident happened at that company. One of probably the most embarrassing thing in my life. Uh, I, I didn't even really talk about this for a long time, but we had a holiday party at this company that was for their employees and their spouses. And at this time, we probably had 50, 60 employees. There was a drinking culture at this company. Like Friday afternoons, we would have beer in the office and socialize and whatever. And all of the events that the company had drinking involved with it. And it was fun. And there were a lot of people that were, I would say, moderate to even a couple of heavy drinkers, as is common in Wisconsin. So for some reason, I had helped to plan this event. There was going to be entertainment at this event. It was off site. 
and I remember my wife and I weren't doing that well and we had been in like an argument. So I had this great decision this day. It was on a Saturday. The event started at like seven that I would do some day drinking to get a head start. So Always a good idea. yeah, right. So yeah, I, I showed up at this event probably five to eight drinks in and then had several more drinks at this event and we had this like entertainment that was there this guy was doing this like family feud type thing and it wasn't going well and i like got up and cut them off and made a scene and i, I basically made a fool of myself and it was apparent that i was intoxicated and i was making poor judgments got home late that night. The guy I was working for who owned the business was concerned enough about me. He came to my house that night to see if I was okay. Going into work that next Monday was not fun, right? Here I am as the leader of this business. Here I am with this Ivy League pedigree, business leader, blah, 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 blah. And I'm a fuck drunk. And I go in there full of fear like, what did I do? How bad is this? I had never lost a job in my life. And thinking like, how bad is this? Is this guy going to say like, you can't run my business? So he didn't that day. But three months later, we were supposed to do this small acquisition that fell apart for something that really wasn't up to me. But we had a meeting and he let me know that he was going to move in a different direction. And I wasn't going to run his business anymore. He didn't say you're fired, but I lost that job because of my alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of 2016. And then that began, whew, my, my second trip to the Plymouth House was in November of 2018. So that next whole period was, was not good. And I was Cliff, for our listeners, will you just um, mention what the Plymouth House is? Thanks. Yeah, the Plymouth House is a inpatient residential treatment facility in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Old school, hardcore, 12 steps, non-clinical. I went there in June of 2018, and I didn't want to go there, but my family wanted me to go there. And my wife and my three sons and my mother and my sister and her husband and their three kids. Uh, my mom had planned a cruise to Alaska uh, for all of us. Uh, they let me know that I was not welcome mm. to go on that cruise. So they said, you should go to the Plymouth House instead. So uh, I went there in June of 2018. It's a 28-day program. And I checked myself out against medical advice after 14 days. There was a counselor there named Matt Howe. He's a friend of mine now. He's a Boston guy. And I remember distinctly him saying, you're making a bad decision here. You're not ready. And I was like, no, I got this. He's like, you don't even know what you don't know. And you are so far from having this. And he said, you got a big ego problem too. And we kind of got into like an argument. And I was like, no, man, I got this. He's like, you don't. And when I was leaving, he was a funny guy too. And he said, Cliff, I'll see you again. I said, what do you mean? He said, you'll be back. And I think I said, like, you or something like that, like, because um, I knew, right? So I went home here to Madison, and I had 90 days of sobriety. Brutal sobriety. Not going to meetings, not having a sponsor, just white knuckling it, angry at the world. And I had never been an angry person. And the disease, it got really bad. Mm -hmm. Like I could not live life on life's terms. And I even kind of became a little bit of a victim, mm -hmm. right? Like that guy who relieved me of my duties, like I was mad at him. Like looking back, so stupid, right? Like that was all me. So after 90 days, I decided that it would be okay to have a drink. I was going to a high school football game and I stopped to get gas on the way. And I went into a gas station, of course, in Wisconsin, you can buy beer anywhere. anywhere. And I walked in. So I did the gas thing outside and I walked in, I was going to get a pack of gum. And I remember walking in, I remember seeing in the corner of my eye, like the beer thing. And I was like, no way. 
no way. And then I was like, I walked over and I was like, I can have one. And it was a 24 ounce of a tin can thing. And I came out, I got in the truck and I drove and I didn't drink it. And I got to the parking lot and I drank it before the game. And I went in and I was sitting up in the, the booth because I was uh, watching on the headset so I could, you know, tell the coaches what defense they were playing. And I went home and I was like, oh, cool. See, I can do that. And the next day I went to the store and bought a 12 pack and bought some, and it was on and it went fast. And my wife had said, if you drink again, I'm going to ask that you are not living in our home. I don't want my children to grow up around you when you're drinking. And I didn't think she would do that, but she let me know that I was not welcome in our home. And she actually found an apartment for me and she helped me move. And that was October of 2018. And we'll get to the end here because this is the end of the uh, alcoholic part. And then I hit my bottom. I wasn't working at this time. I lived in an apartment about a mile from my house and I became an around the clock drinker and it was horrible. And I was living in deplorable condition. I remember vaguely being outside the liquor store at 7.57 in the morning, drinking around the clock. I think I was drinking to die and really no will to live. And Shanna and I were still communicating and by a text message and she didn't hear from me for a couple of days. And you know what's interesting? I remember like while I was struggling that couple of years when things weren't good, a lot of my friends and friends, like people were reaching out to me for a while, like checking in. And I remember I wouldn't answer the phone a lot because I didn't want to talk to people and I was hiding and, and the phone stopped ringing. And I had never felt alone in, in my whole life. And I, I was alone in this apartment without it's crazy with, with, with no one near me, no one checking in on me. And Shanna uh, hadn't heard back from me. So she did a welfare check. And she came to the apartment, she had a key, and she came in and found me in deplorable condition. My room was a deflated air mattress with rotting food in the refrigerator, bottle. I was cold to the touch. I don't know if I was close to dying, but she was so scared. She called my sister, who's a registered nurse who lives in Boston. My sister got in a flight out to Madison and she drove me back 17 hours to boston and they tried to put me into mclean treatment center and i'd spent the night before at my sister's house and i was drinking because if i didn't drink i could feel like really bad withdrawals and they wouldn't take me in because they tested my blood alcohol which was super high i don't even know what it was so they rushed me by an ambulance to a hospital newton wellesley hospital where I did a six day detox uh, with all the medication and everything. I had a horrible hallucination there where I got up in the middle of the night and I pulled everything out and I tried to walk out of the hospital. I didn't even know I was in Boston. I said, my truck's outside and the security guards had to like take me and put me back in the room. Just absolutely crazy. And then after six days of detoxing, I went up to the Plymouth house the second time and my friend Chris did the intake. He's a good friend of mine now. He works at the Plymouth House. And they had been there before and they have a lot of repeat guests. And he looked at my folder when he was doing the intake and he looked me right in the eyes and he had these steely blue eyes. And he said, Cliff, you've had a great life. You have a beautiful wife, three kids. You've had tremendous success. He said, I have a really odd question for you. He said, why are you killing yourself? and it hit me yeah. and I still had like this false pride and I responded with profane I was like you he said I get it man I get it you're a big tough guy I know that he said it is what you're doing though man and he said I'm going to give you some strange advice and I can't believe this is what he said he said if you really want to do that put a gun in your mouth because you are causing pain and suffering for so many people and you're taking everyone down with you. And we see people coming in here. Some people are alone. You're not. You have people who still love you and still care for you. And it hit me. Like it hit me. And it hit me hard. 
And then something happened over the next few days. Like four days later, we did a third step in this chapel that they have there. And that's, you know, made a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. And Jim, one of the counselors there, who is also a friend of mine now, he said, Cliff, don't do this if you're not really going to do this. He said, you, you can't fake this. You have to do this and don't do this unless you're really ready. And I felt ready. And they have this beautiful chapel. It's a little white chapel. And we went in and I had one of these sudden spectacular things. It was so powerful. And we did this ceremony. He said, all right, get, get on our knees and we're going to say this prayer and repeat after me. And there were two other people. And I remember kneeling down and says, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self. And when I said relieve me of the bondage of self, there was a window over there and there was this light coming in. And I felt like, whoa, there's this light. And then I felt a voice. Mm. And I heard a voice. And the voice said, Cliff, what are you doing? I'm still here. Do you think you built this great life by yourself? And I felt bad mm. for God or this higher power. I felt like a jerk. He was like, and then I said, I, I don't know. And we did this together and we can do it again, but you got to let me in. Mm. So mm. can we do this again? And it will be good. It will be good. And I guess I was ready and I said, yes. And, and like, it was fast, like then, and I remember like now, like, all right, game on, let's work, mm. let's do the work. And then I worked mm. steps four, five, six, and seven for the next few weeks there. And then I kept doing the work and that was November 18th, 2018, things have been really, really good since then. I did slip technically it's crazy. Six months later, I went out for a short period of time, which is absolutely insane, but that was the bottom and it was painful and dark but and i don't know how much time we have since then it's continued to get better and better and better and better and now i can say 100 percent it was complete honesty like i love being an alcoholic in recovery i've learned so much and the way that i try to convey this to newcomers is i didn't know i had a monkey on my mm -hmm. back at all and then i finally acknowledged maybe i do and, and then with doing the work and, and, and doing the deep work and trying to understand the root cause why was i so afraid what was i running away from i realized i did have a monkey on my back and as time passes it's like no it was a orangutan it was a chimpanzee it was a gorilla and it seems like now i keep getting lighter and lighter but i have to do the work all the time and they say there's a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition that was a huge part of why i chose to come over here and, and work full time with recovery.com and, and do like i love being in the middle mm. all day every day I, it's where i'm safe but i also hope that i can help you know and with 47,000 connections in May mm -hmm. on our platform. Mm -hmm. If I can be like, my dad didn't get a shot. A, a couple of my high school friends are gone. A college teammate of mine, like they didn't get a shot. And these are privileged white men who didn't get a shot. What about all these other marginalized people that haven't been able to get a shot? Like that concept to me, like we're able to already give these people a shot mm -hmm. at this. Mm -hmm. I, I've never been more inspired and I don't think it's random that my office was down the hall from Ben and Jeremiah, but I love thinking that too, that I, I'm not driving and there's something much bigger than me. And I feel like now I can see and, and, and feel the signs and the direction in a way that I couldn't before. 
Cliff, I think just by sharing your story, you're helping people. And just a couple things I wanted to go back to. I too had like a voice experience and worked steps one through three, probably a dozen times. So I want to know, especially because you mentioned going back out six months out, which I did too, about a dozen times. What drew you back in? Mm -hmm. What made you not say, well, I did it. I worked really hard and it didn't work. So I guess I'm just a failure. What drew you back in? So I went and and tested it and I didn't drink. So it wasn't fun at all. I think maybe, Amanda, it was just kind of like confirming, like, and I didn't know why I drank. I didn't want to. I knew I didn't want to drink. That's where I think it's coming back and powerful. Totally. You know, it is so far from fun. Like it was just instant chaos. And then like, do I have to lie again and be dishonest again and create it? Like you just saw like that. It just got chaotic again. And I didn't want that at all. But what I did after that six months that I hadn't done before, I got a sponsor. Mm -hmm. I worked the steps, which is crazy that it took all of that. And and that was when it was like, okay. And I could really start to feel it then. I think the 12 steps are absolutely amazing. So They are a code to live by for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. And would you say your community also, I mean, you had your AA community, but now you had a sponsor. What else, what was your alumni community like? Where did you go after Plymouth House? Yeah, so after the Plymouth House, the second time, I actually lived in a sober living place in Boston called The Overlook, which was great. It was a really, really nice place. And I was there for 60 days. What I also did there, I saw a therapist for the first time ever in my life. And in three sessions (laughs) with a therapist, we unlocked so much. She was the one that when I told her, my family background and when I started and all this, she referred to me as a ticking Mm -hmm. time bomb. She was like, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. You held it together as long as you did and you were just destined to explode. And you did. Now we can do the rebuilding, but let's dive in to why. So therapy was huge. Prayer and meditation is huge. Fellowship is huge. I'm lucky I've got local fellowship with my home group. You guys know Trey. Mm -hmm. On our advisory board, we have an unbelievable Dartmouth recovery group. I failed to mention when when I hit my bottom and my wife saved me that time, my wife and my sister told all of my friends and my college football teammates that I was really struggling. Mm. So it was extremely public. When I was at the Plymouth House that second time, I got 52 letters in mm. a month from people that wrote me letters of support and love. And remember all that nonsense about I didn't belong at Dartmouth and all that, blah, 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 blah. It took that for me to realize I did belong there. And they told me I belonged there as much or as more than anyone. And I had earned it, which was wonderful. And I think this is unhealthy. Dr. Molly, you can let me know the clinical opinion of this, but I hate letting people down. Mm, Yeah. And and people pleasing is dangerous, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, But I feel like it's a healthy inspiration for me. I don't want to let any of those people down. Like they they supported me so much, my wife, my kids, my family, my friends. But I also, more than anything else, I don't want to let me down. Yeah. That's That's what I was waiting for. Yeah. 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 And and one one of the things that the, the therapist shared with me was to be good to myself Mm -hmm. and that didn't land and i i didn't even realize i was being so hard on myself Mm -hmm. and i think i had said you know all this stuff the unhealthy savior narcissistic ego blah 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 all that stuff like i had put this pressure on myself like i gotta do all this stuff and i have to achieve and create this brand and this pet like it's nonsense Mm -hmm. it's really unhealthy she was like, you just be you. That's it. That was odd. And she said, first thing you got to do is treat yourself with compassion and be your own best mm-hmm. friend, which is weird. You did such a beautiful job of telling us what it was like, what happened, and you 
told us a little bit about what it's like now, but I'd love to hear what keeps you strong in your recovery day after day after day. Yeah, thank you. So I love routine. I get up uh, early in the morning and I do some physical work, whether it's exercise or running or walking or yoga. And then I follow that up with some spiritual work every day, which is a lot of reading, different spiritual work. On the weekends, I go to a 6.30 a.m. group with my home group here. Sometimes I go to meetings during the week and then I come to work and I feel like I'm working in, in recovery all day, every day. It's different though. And then I'm a creature of habit. I usually am in bed by nine, whether it's Sunday or Thursday or Saturday and kind of repeat. And Amanda, early, I thought that was boring. I love boring now. <laughs> and, uh, and it's it's okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm also a lot more comfortable. Like I realized I really struggled to be present. Mm. I, I'm, I'm almost certain there would have been an ADD, ADHD diagnosis. I remember I couldn't sit still in class and shocker, I would become addicted to a depressant. I enjoy also solitude, mm. being still. I like being alone. I like going for walks in the woods and I have a long way to go with my meditation practice, but I'm practicing. Being still is good too. And I do love my work. I, th th there's a danger. I am someone that struggles with addiction. I love this work and, and I love putting in the work here too. And I know you are a strong believer and you can't keep it if you don't give it away. So I know you sponsor other men and that's such great work in the world. I do. Yeah. And I've had sponsoring is humbling. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've a couple of guys that it didn't work, but I've got four people that are really, really thriving and now they're sponsoring. And we've got this little kind of family tree thing, which is going, mm -hmm. which is really cool. One of the many gifts, and this one stems from the accidental kind of outing of me as an alcoholic and it being pretty public, my phone every week, I'll get a text or a call mm -hmm. from someone that has someone that they know who's struggling. So I'm, I've become a bit of a resource, which I, I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. and, and I like someone that people feel safe reaching out to. I, I do really enjoy helping people. I know you've been doing so much to channel all of that energy into this beautiful work and supporting other individuals through the sponsorship, through coaching, through consulting. And now you've also been able to write a book. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mala. Here's the author's copy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Don't Sell, Generate Revenue. Our consulting firm is a growth advisory consulting firm that helps uh, lower mid-market businesses scale. And as you know, Rehab Path was a client. I was in revenue responsible roles for a long time. Uh, which means you're in sales or business development or marketing. And I remember early feeling that I did not identify well with being a salesperson. Mm. I thought that the image of salespeople who were selfish and not trustworthy and all that, it, and that wasn't inspiring to me to be in that kind of a role. So over time, I thought mindset is so important. Could we reframe mm -hmm. that? and really think differently of the work that we do. So this is really based on reframing. If you're revenue responsible, you don't have to identify as a salesperson. You can identify as a revenue generator and there's, there's really big differences. So this book really provides some methodology on how to do that well, but it's a lot of mindset too, because that work is really hard. And if you don't have the right mindset, and the mindset really is rooted in, I like the idea of what we're trying to do is help as many people as we can. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. And we have abundant resources at our company that we've used capital to create. I get to share that mm -hmm. abundantly with as many people as possible. That's hard to do if you don't really believe in your product or your yes. service. Yeah. But if you do, and we do we here. Do. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been able to be as free and aggressive as I can today with what we mm -hmm. have. And I will never apologize for that mm -hmm. <laughs> because at the end of the day, we truly are helping people mm -hmm. right? Save, saving lives, yeah. which is great. And Dr. Mala, there is a zero 
0.0% chance that I am an author of a book if I'm not in recovery. I would have talked about yeah. it, like, oh, I'm going to write a book someday or this or mm -hmm. that, and no chance. No chance. So being able to be focused mm -hmm. and disciplined, and that's the heavy lift, writing a sure. book, putting in the time and, and coordinating it, and mm -hmm. it's Amazon self-publishing. And I had some help from some great people. I don't think it's going to be a masterpiece or a New York Times bestseller, but I have shared the author's copy with a few people and I've gotten surprisingly really good feedback. The whole goal, I want people to think differently about what we do. Mm -hmm. and I, I think it's kind of do that. So I love, thank you for making Of course. Me. No, I mean, I love that. And it really is kind of like coming full circle in that your entire journey has required that shift in thinking. So you're applying it to all aspects of your life. And that's so wonderful to see. And I know I'm thankful for that on a daily basis. You know, that the fact that I get to work with you, but the fact that you get to share that with our immediate culture here is just phenomenal. So thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And remember, it, yeah, and, and what I felt in my heart mm -hmm. when I was an 18-year-old kid was I wanted to be a coach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In different oh, arenas, for sure. right? Yeah. So I can coach in recovery yeah. with sponsoring. I can coach in business with revenue-responsible people. And I'm coaching high school football this year. At I Madison love it. West. Love it. Yay. Awesome. So we'll land on Amanda. Did you have any other questions? No, let's bring us home. Okay. Ask that amazing last question you yeah. always ask. What does recovery mean to you? Let's... So I knew, right? This is how we end the podcast. Yeah. And mine is pretty simple. Recovery is the opportunity to realize your full potential. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time. There's like probably 50 other questions I'd love to ask you, <laughs> but we'll save it for part two. And part two, I was just going to yeah, say. Yeah, yes. yeah. And I'm, I'm just so excited to share this with our audience. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. This was fun. And I've shared my story a lot. Each time it's different. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, this, you took me to some different places and I felt some things I hadn't felt in a while, which is good. Mm -hmm. So thank you for both being great guides and great hosts. I'm really, really grateful. And I'm grateful to have teammates like you guys too. Glad you're here.